Okay, these are going to be our notes for antiderivatives. So we're going to start off with the definition. We call a function f. Now notice this is capital F. Capital F is called an antiderivative of lowercase f on an interval i if the derivative of the capital F function gives you the lowercase f function for all x on that interval. So capital F is the antiderivative. And if you take the derivative of the antiderivative, then what you get is your lowercase function f. In other words, an antiderivative essentially undoes a derivative. So, for example, uh, one possible antiderivative, if you have this function f of x equals x, okay, notice this is our lowercase function. If you want the antiderivative of x, what you need to do is figure out what function did we start with whose derivative ended up being x. So one possible antiderivative for that is 1 half times x squared. Because notice if you take the derivative of this antiderivative, what you're going to do is drop the 2. That will cancel out your 1 half, and you'll just get x. Now the reason I've said 1 possible is because while the derivative of 1 half x squared is x, so is the derivative of 1 half x squared, let's say, plus 5, or minus 1 half. Okay? I can add any constant on here and it would still be considered an antiderivative of x. So because of that, what we generally talk about is the general antiderivative. So if this capital F is an antiderivative, one possible antiderivative of the lowercase f, then the most general antiderivative of that lowercase f is capital F, there's your, your antiderivative, plus c, and that's literally going to be a c, where we call c an arbitrary constant. It's understood that it's representative of just some constant. So for example, if we were asked to find the most general antiderivative of, let's say, f of x equals x squared, okay, so our antiderivative, capital F of x, what we need to figure out is what function did we start with whose derivative ended up being x squared? Well, we know because of the power rule that it would have to be an x cubed because the derivative of an x cubed will contain an x squared. But the problem is it's not just going to be x squared when you take its derivative. It's going to be 3x squared, and we don't want the 3 in there. So the way we counteract that is by putting a 1 third in front, and then we add on the arbitrary constant plus c. So notice, you should always be able to check these. If you're not sure, take the derivative of your antiderivative. You should come back to this function. So when you drop the 3, that will cancel the 1 third, and you'll get x squared. And the derivative of the constant will, of course, go to 0. For another example, if you have f of x equals 3x to the third power, okay, we want to figure out the antiderivative for it. Well, if we look at the power, we know this has to have an x to the fourth in it because the only way to get a function whose derivative contains an x cubed is to start off with an x to the fourth. But of course, the derivative of x to the fourth isn't 3x cubed, it's 4x cubed. So what we need to do is figure out what to multiply by to undo the 4 that's going to be in front and replace it with a 3. Well, notice you replace it with a 3, and you get rid of the 4. There's a 3 fourths, and you add the arbitrary constant. So double check it. If you take the derivative of 3 fourths x to the fourth, when you drop the 4, the 4's will cancel, and you'll be left with 3x cubed, which is what we wanted, because the derivative of the constant will go to 0. So let's see if we can kind of establish a pattern for this. So notice, every time we take an antiderivative of x to some power, what's happening is the power in the antiderivative is increased by 1, and then we also have to account for these coefficients out front. So what we notice is that, in general, the antiderivative for x to some n, and that's just some power, the antiderivative capital F of x is given by, here's your x increased by 1 on the power. So the power goes up by 1. To undo the fraction that would result at, by taking the derivative of this using power rule, you put 1 over the new power out front, then you add the arbitrary constant. This will actually work for all x to the n except for 1. 
If n equals negative 1, now we have problems. Um, in that case, you would be taking the antiderivative of f of x equals x to the negative 1, also known as 1 over x. And this one gets sticky because if you try to add 1 to your exponent, in that case, somehow you'd end up with x to the 0. And remember, anything to the 0 power is 1. And this is definitely not the antiderivative of 1 over x. So something funky happens when an n equals negative 1, which we are not examining at the moment. A couple of other general guidelines that are helpful. Um, if you are taking the antiderivative of the addition of two functions or the difference between two functions, so addition or subtraction, what you can do is take the antiderivative of each one of them individually and then just add a single arbitrary constant. Now, notice this is not true for multiplication or division. Now the reason is because remember in order to take a derivative involving multiplication or division you have to apply things like power rule and quotient rule. Uh, so undoing those is not simplistic. Whereas when you're taking a derivative of functions being added or subtracted you just take the derivative of each one of them individually. So the antiderivatives of f of x plus or minus g of x will be straightforward. The antiderivative of multiplication and division, meaning undoing the product rule and quotient rule, that's not straightforward. It requires a lot more than just these simple rules. Another rule to keep in mind is that if you've got, I changed this constant to k, so k is a constant. If you have that constant times a function f of x and you're looking for its antiderivative, what you can do is leave the constant out of it, take the antiderivative, and then add the arbitrary constant. So that's where this one's c. Again, this is because of the basic rules of derivatives, which we're just undoing for the antiderivatives. So let's say we wanted to find the most general antiderivative of f of x equals 5x to the 1 half plus x to the negative 3 halves. So the most general antiderivative will be able to deal with the antiderivative of each term separately. For the first one, in the beginning, I'm just going to leave this 5 out of it, leave the constant out of the antiderivative, and then take the antiderivative of x to the 1 half. Now remember, we're going to use this first rule for that. We're going to take x, we're going to increase it by 1, so 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. Now out front, what we need is 1 over the new power. So that's 1 over 3 halves. But that's just the reciprocal of 3 halves, which is 2 thirds. That's the first term. For the second term, we'll have x. We will increase the power by 1. So we'll have negative 3 halves plus 1, which becomes negative 1 half. And then in front, we need 1 over negative 1 half, which again is its reciprocal, which is just negative 2. And then we add our arbitrary constant. Now let me clean this up a little bit. So my antiderivative, once I clean this up, is going to be 10 thirds x to the 3 halves minus 2x to the negative 1 half. Or you can write it as 2 over the square root of x. Either one's great. And again, if you're not sure, take the derivative of the antiderivative you should come back to that function right there. The other thing we want to take into consideration when we're looking at antiderivatives, remember we also know the derivative of our six trig functions. Things like the derivative of sine x is cosine x, the derivative of cosecant x is negative cosecant x cotangent x. So if we know their derivatives, we should also be able to work with them as far as antiderivatives go. So if f of x equals sine x, then capital F of x, its antiderivative should be, now you can start off by thinking of it as cosine x because we know sine x and cosine x are related by derivatives, but if you take the derivative of cosine x, you don't get sine x, you get negative sine x. So in order to counteract that negative, we need a negative in front and we add our arbitrary constant. If we wanted to take the antiderivative of cosine x, well, what function do we start with whose derivative is cosine x? Yeah, it's sine x, and we don't have to compensate for a negative in this case. If we have f of x equals secant x tangent x plus secant squared x, okay, notice the plus, so I'm going to be able to take the antiderivative of each term individually. The antiderivative of secant x tangent x 
is secant x, and the antiderivative of secant squared x is tan x. There we go. Now notice this does mean there are only six types of trig functions, barring any constants, that I can ask you for the antiderivative of. So for example, I cannot ask you, hey, if f of x equals tan x, what does at capital F of x equal? What's the antiderivative of tan x? Well, we don't know because none of our six trig functions have tangent x as a derivative. So I don't know what function to start with to end up with tangent x when I'm done taking its derivative. This is not a question that I can currently ask you. So the types of trig functions are going to be pretty specific. Let's look at another example. If we want to find f, if the derivative of f at x equals x square root x and f of 1 equals 2. Now notice the change in directions here a little bit. We're now looking for a lowercase f, but don't let that confuse you. Notice what I've given you is the derivative. So this question is stated differently, but the idea is the same. I'm looking for the function to start with whose derivative ended up being x times the square root of x. So even though it's written differently, we're still looking for the antiderivative of x square root x. The other thing that's different about this example is we've been given this condition, that when you plug 1 into the function f, the output should be 2. We'll come back for that one in a second. So first, let's start with f prime of x equals x square root x. Now be a little bit careful. Remember, we just said, if you want to find the antiderivative of something, and there's multiplication involved, you absolutely cannot just take the antiderivative of x times the antiderivative of the square root of x. It's not going to get you the right answer. So how are you supposed to work with this one? Well, I've cheated just a little bit. You can rewrite this. Keep in mind, this is x to the first power times x to the one-half power. They have the same base, which means this is just x to the one plus one-half, which is three halves. Now the antiderivative is actually very easy because it's just x to a power. So we have x. We increase the power by 1, so instead of 3 halves, it becomes 5 halves. We put 1 over the new power out front, so that's 2 fifths, and we add on the arbitrary constant. So we've met the first requirement. This is the most general antiderivative of f prime of x equals x square root x. Now what we also need to do, though, is meet the second condition, the d that when we plug 1 in for x into f, not into the derivative, into f, when we plug 1 in, we should output 2. So notice, when we plug 1 in, that's f of 1, we get 2 fifths times 1 to the 5 halves plus c. That's our arbitrary constant. And when we plug in 1, the output should be 2. So when we look at this equation, notice what that's going to allow us to solve for. It's going to allow us to solve for that arbitrary constant. So 1 to the 5 halves is 1. We get 2 fifths plus c equals 2 and just subtract 2 fifths from both sides so that c is 8 fifths. So if you want a function that meets both conditions, its derivative is x to the 3 halves, and when you plug 1 in you get 2, the only function that meets that condition is this one, 2 fifths x to the 5 halves with this specific arbitrary constant, so plus 8 fifths. So when you see problems that give you some kind of condition, what that's going to allow you to do is solve for your arbitrary constant. Okay, let's look at one more. A particle moves in a straight line and has acceleration given by a of t equals 6t plus 4. Its initial velocity is given by v of 0 equals negative 6 meters per second, and its initial displacement is s of 0 equals 9 meters. Find its position function. Now if you remember, from previous sections. In general, the relationship between position, velocity, and acceleration is the velocity is the first derivative of the position function, and the acceleration is the first derivative of the velocity function, which in turn is the second derivative of the position function. 
So we have that relationship already established. So, but in this case, we've been given the acceleration and we're looking for the position function. So instead of taking derivatives, we're actually looking to take antiderivatives. And in this case, it's not one antiderivative we need, but two. Notice we've also been given two conditions. So chances are we're going to be able to solve for both arbitrary constants. Let's start with the acceleration function. So if acceleration is 6t plus 4, then the velocity is its antiderivative. So uh, if we increase the power on t by 1, it becomes t squared. Now we would need a 1 half in front of this, but there's already a 6. So 6 divided by that 2, or 6 times that 1 half, is going to be 3t squared. And then the antiderivative of 4 is going to be 4t plus some arbitrary constant. Now we know from this condition that when we plug 0 in for the time, which means this 0 is out and this 0 is out, we get plus c, that the result should be negative 6. So in this particular case, c is negative 6. So my entire velocity function is 3t squared plus 4t minus 6. And we repeat the process one more time to get the position function. So s of t should be the antiderivative of the velocity. So that's going to be t cubed plus, that's going to be 4 times 1 half t squared, so that's 2t squared minus 6t plus some other arbitrary constant. Now I'm going to change the letter because I don't want there to be confusion. Uh, I don't want to use c again, because if I use c again, you might think that it's the same as the c that's up here in the velocity function, and it's not. So that's why I'm just going to change it to d. It still represents an arbitrary constant. And we know from this condition that when we plug 0 into our position function, which is going to 0 out this term, this term, and this term, I'm just going to be left with d equal to 9. So the position function, s of t for this one, is t cubed plus 2t squared minus 6t plus 9, and that's going to be meters. And that's our position function.